Our solution to what would be my question. So if our solution is that we have to get off CO2, um, how are we going to do that? Uh, I'll say my view is that we can't in the short term, maybe in 200 years, but these are, you know, transitions for major energies are going to be gradual. They can only be gradual, certainly, but not in the next 25 years. So it's going to take time. But in the meantime, what are we going to do? We're going to continue to use fossil fuels. Perhaps if we want to reduce our environmental footprints and reduce emissions, if we want to reduce emissions, we should emphasize natural gas over coal. That's pretty obvious. And, uh, you know, gas plants are very small footprint, great energy. Uh, LNG allows us to export it and all of that. So it's a good uh, and, and there's no shortage of natural gas. We haven't even started to look at natural gas hydrates, which exist in, uh, at, at depth in cold regions. We did studies on the coast of um, the Mackenzie Delta. Huge resources of natural gas at depth frozen in uh, gas uh, hydrates, clathrates, and probably exceeds all the known hydrocarbon resources that we have, including the oil sands at this point. So we're not going to run out. And it's not bad for uh, the environment to burn. We produce CO2, but the CO2 is cycling into much larger reservoirs. It's cycling every four years. We turn over the atmospheric reservoir of CO2. It goes, it exchanges with the terrestrial and the marine uh, carbon pools. And so we're really mixing our anthropogenic CO2 or fossil fuel CO2 with a much larger uh, natural carbon source. Not insignificantly, we're putting about 1% into the atmosphere, so about 0.02% into the global actively churning carbon cycle, carbon reservoirs, per year. And if we add up all the carbon that we have burnt since the Industrial Revolution, when we started burning coal at some, uh, some haste, uh, we've maybe added 10% to that reservoir. And we can see this, we can measure this, we can quantify it. It's, it's uh, easily demonstrated that we've added that amount. But uh, the consequences of that certainly isn't the one degree of warming that we've had since the Little Ice Age. Most climate scientists recognize that up to three quarters of that warming is natural, solar and uh, internal uh, drivers, but not CO2. They're only blaming, you know, 50% 50, uh, 50 of the second half of the century, which is about 25% of warming since the Little Ice Age, on our CO2. And so, and that's a guess, because in their document, in the IPCC science document, they say they are extremely confident that up to, you know, that, that more than 50% of the warming since 1950, which is 1980, is CO2. When they use terms like that and 50%, to me, that's a guess. Somebody says, yeah, we haven't quite got it. We don't really know, but eh, 50%, maybe more than 50%. That's the science. And that's 50% of half of the warming since the Little Ice Age. So what happens if we do all this energy transition and get ourselves off of CO2 the best we can, and then the natural component, we, you know, we crest that curve of the modern warming, just like it happened back at the medieval climate optimum. It all went back to the little ice age. And that's no good. An ice age, a little ice age, is devastating for agriculture. Yeah, it will. We know it will because we see the records. We see the climate records. Now, we can hope, we can hope that CO2 has having a minimal effect and is preventing that little ice age from coming. I would hope that. So bring on the CO2. It's helping us. 
because if anything we know about climate, it's that cold is bad and warm is good. And all the warming we've had up uh, since the Little Ice Age up to today, everybody's touting about with great fear and, and trumpeted anxiety about the, um, you know, we've reached records, new records, new global 2023, warmest summer on earth in recorded history. I say great because it's so much better than cold. And we can go back and look at records of, uh, the, it's a different time back then, agriculture was different than all the rest, but we do know that when it gets cold, it's bad for agriculture. When it gets warm, it's good for agriculture, and we have a big population to feed. When it's bad for agriculture, the population plummets, uh, people suffer, and people die. You know, with, with, when it's cold, uh, the deaths, even today, if we look at statistics, deaths from cold, our winters, greatly exceed deaths from heat, despite the heat domes that we've had. You know, 40 degrees in Spain this summer and all the rest. Uh, people suffer, people survive, but cold, uh-uh, people die, 10 to one.